All right, welcome to this week's Thursdays on the Stoop. Today we have writing about challenging topics with Autumn Kanapka. Autumn Kanapka is a writer, runner, and trauma-informed teaching artist. She was the 2016 Poet Laureate of Montgomery County, PA. Her poetry chapbook, A Chain of Paper Dolls, was published in 2014 by the Head and the Hand Press in Philadelphia, and her work has been published widely in literary journals. Autumn holds degrees in creative writing from the University of Pittsburgh and Antioch University, and she teaches writing courses at Chestnut Hill College. Her first novel, Bidipides Didn't Die, was published in August 2023. Thank you so much for being here. Take it away, Autumn. Thank you so much for having me. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm in a small room and the air conditioner is on. And so if it gets really loud, I tried to shut it off and it didn't. And I, I don't know. Technology is not being my friend right now. Um, so thank you all for coming. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I can do that effectively. Um, there. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to talk about writing challenging topics. Um, and I just want to thank Blue Stoop again for having me. Um, I'm really, I, I love talking about this and I'm so grateful to them um, for giving me the space to do this and share this, this information. So let's see, hopefully. Oh, so now it's, see, I knew, why is it doing that to me? Okay, so the first thing I wanna do um, before we get started, um, thank you all for being here. Um, in whatever capacity you are in, it is, you know, four o'clock, you could be coming from work, you could be getting, you know, in between jobs, um, you could be just kind of starting your day, whatever you are bringing, whatever energy you have, um, what I want you to do is kind of look at this tree um, and think about which blob on that tree you most identify with. Um, and I, you can, if you want to, you can drop the number in the chat. Um, if you, you know, you can also just keep it for yourself. You can say why, you cannot say, you know, whatever you want. This is really just more of a check-in for you to kind of take your temperature about where you're at today and in this moment um, as we get started. Um, so do that for one second. I'm gonna let you have a second to look at that and then we're gonna move on. Sorry, I got my child to bring me coffee too. So um, let's see, I am trying to see where we are in the chat. I love this. Number two, I do a lot of yes. Um, 15 and four simultaneously. Yes. Yes. Thank you all so much. Ah, feeling relaxed. Spent a lot of day in the park writing. Oh, what a beautiful day for that. Well, I mean, I'm not sure. Actually, as I'm thinking about this, if you want to, I, um, I'm curious where everyone is coming from. Um, Susan, love this graphic. Um, there's on the on the um, slide, you can see it's there's this website called blobtree.com that has a whole set of resources with the blob tree. I really, really love it um, and highly recommend. So um, if you want to drop also into the chat, just for curiosity's sake, like where you are in the world, um, obvious, you know, for those that, you know, don't know, Blue Stoop is based in Philadelphia. I live just outside of Philadelphia. Um, I'm sure that some of you are from the Philadelphia area, but I also think that some of you up oh, Southern British Columbia, yes, Southeastern British Columbia. So um, Cincinnati, fantastic. Um, my sister-in-law lives in Cincinnati. Um, so uh, great, Lambertville. This is fantastic. I love sort of getting a sense of where we're all at, where we're coming from, um, both physically and also kind of emotionally, you know, in our brain spaces, right? So thank you very, very much. All right. So um, I'm going to close the chat for a minute there, but I'll reopen it 
So this is what we're going to do today. We did our welcome and our check-in. We are, um, I'm going to briefly introduce myself a little bit. I'm so grateful um, to Julian for already doing that. So I should not have to do a little bit, but I just kind of want to give you a little sense of why I want to talk about hard things. Then we're going to talk, talk about what hard things are, um, what I think trauma-informed fiction is, some strategies for writing that. Um, maybe we will look at an example. I really kind of base that on time. And then um, I really want to prioritize the discussion part. So that's kind of where those last two bullets, if we're running lower on time, I will uh, skip sort of the the sample and go to the discussion or we'll we'll figure it out based on what everybody wants. So, okay. So brief intro, um, I'm, like I said, I live just outside of Philadelphia. I love reggaeton. Um, I love running, rom-coms and sports movies. Um, I, you know, we already had my full bio, um, but the thing that I really kind of wanted to talk about is that, you know, like I was, I've been a poet for a really long time and I never thought I would really write a novel. Um, but, you know, as it turns out, like most of pe people, like I, the pandemic came and I did things, you know, we all did things that we didn't think we were going to do. And I started writing a novel. Um, and my writing has always been a way for me to sort of make art out of my shitty life experiences. Um, and so what I started writing in 2021 came out of being in a really, really deep depression. Um, and so I was just kind of writing because this this character appeared in my head and she was in a really, really bad place. But somehow I knew that I could save her. I couldn't figure out how to do that for myself, but I knew that I could write a path for her. And that was just what I started doing. Um, and when I was doing that, or like right around that time, I did trauma-informed teaching or trauma-informed teacher practice training with um, the Stockton Rush Bar Bartol Foundation. And that really sort of informed my thinking about everything at the time. And so um, I was writing this novel that I really thought was just going to end up being an abandoned file on my laptop, but I knew that whatever I wanted to write, I wanted to get in really close. Like I needed to get in really close to the trauma, to the really hard parts, but I also wanted it to be hopeful and I wanted it to be a love story, but I also didn't want it to have all of the like salvation tropes that we see in a lot of, you know, romance or love stories or whatever, you know, like when you have a happy ending, a lot of times it's like, one person swoops in and saves the other. And I knew I didn't want to do that either. Um, so I just, I kept writing, leaning in. And I realized as I was doing that, that what I was doing, um, once I once I realized it was something that I really wanted to move on with, and I started working with a publisher and I had editors looking at it, I really started to realize that was not especially typical or welcome to write into those really difficult spaces. I had editors and publishers and even author friends tell me why, you know, publishers don't want, you know, the the rape scene. Publishers don't want the abuse. They don't want the sex. Like, I mean, granted, you know, romance, and spicy novels are doing great. But if you're writing something that's maybe more quote unquote literary, and I sort of hate that, but it is what it is. Um, there's this idea that like, we just fade to black during certain things. And I just can't write that way. And I didn't want to, and I wasn't really given any good reasons not to. And um, as much as I, doubt myself and as insecure as I am as a human, um, 
I had this bit in my gut that said, you know, it's that it was really that Toni Morrison quote that, you know, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you have to write it. And that was sort of like, I just have to keep doing this. Like I have to do this even for me. If I, if I am the only person that reads this, I need to get this done. Um, and I did put it out there. Um, it is hard in a lot of places, but I've had so many people tell me like, thank you. This was really hard, but it was really real. Um, you know, one friend that I've known for a really long time said, your book is not an easy read for me, but I'm finding it strangely cathartic. It's helping me confront some old demons that I tend to run from. I didn't expect the book to affect me like this. I, I get it. No one wants to talk about suicide. The only thing I could ever gravitate to was the movie, The Big Chill. Now I have this book. Thank you. And like, this just was out of the blue. This friend, I mean, I've been friends with this guy for a really long time. And it was just like, you know, to have someone say like, this gave me a place to deal with stuff that nobody wants to talk about really said to me, this is a thing that people want. They want us to get close. They don't want us to fade to black. They don't want us to move away. So that brings me to sort of this graphic. Sharing our story of loss is a gift to us and to the person we've lost. Um, tell your story because being vulnerable and sharing our personal experience is like sending up a flare that helps us find our community and helps our community find us, right? So this really is, it's a gift for ourselves for, you know, this is sort of specifically speaking about, you know, grief, but it's all, it's a gift to those who are involved and it's a gift to those who have experienced this that can't necessarily write about it or find those words. So, Defining hard things. Um, there is no hard and fast rule, obviously. I mean, if it if it feels hard to you, it's hard. End of discussion, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but what am I specifically thinking about? Subjects we avoid in polite conversation, those experiences we tiptoe around in discussion, um, things that we are afraid to bring up. More specifically, things like trauma, right? This is sort of where I start. Um, childhood trauma, abuse, sexual abuse, um, witnessing abuse, rape, miscarriage, fertility challenges, losing someone, especially by violent, violent circumstances, suicide, and more. Um, and so I put the definition of, of trauma here because, you know, I think more and more we're we're getting to understand that trauma is broader than we may have considered in the past and and i think we're we've almost hit this tipping point where now people don't almost don't want to talk about trauma it's almost becoming like trite i resist that idea because i think we have to hold on to the real meaning of it um but an event or series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening, and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning, mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. Um, so, you know, what you think is a trauma, what feels like trauma to you, what you experience as harmful and life-threatening and that continues to bother you, that is you decide that that's trauma. No one else can kind of come in and say, no, that's over with. You don't, it's, it's done. It's not trauma. That wasn't big enough to be trauma. You know, that's, it's really based on the individual's experience. Beyond trauma, other things that I can would consider to be hard things, um, mental illness and neurodivergence. I think we, um, again, depending on what circles you run in, I mean, I do lots of mental health advocacy and work and I surround myself with like artists. And so everybody is like 
talking about their mental illness and their neurodivergence all the time. When I kind of look in other circles, people are a lot more closed about it. Um, so some of these things will may feel more taboo or less taboo. Um, but, you know, things like PTSD, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, I feel like even within the mental health community can be really difficult to talk about. Um, Self-harm, schizophrenia, personality disorders, addiction, ADHD. So those kinds of things are hard. And a lot of times I feel like they get used in surface ways within um, fiction, movies, media, like you know, depression means this, and we don't, we don't really get into what it really is, or the fullness of it. Um, social taboos, I also put under with under hard things, because I again, I, I like to think about, I think that hard things are the things that people don't want us to talk about. So sex and desire, especially within the presence of trauma, like the idea that someone has experienced trauma, um, you know, sex-based trauma, and then could also have a like rich and enjoyable sex life is a strange, you know, people don't want to think about that. Um, racism, uh, you know, especially depending on your own race, I am a white person. I have tried to talk about, um, white race with white people and say like hey maybe we should have a class that's like on you know for white people to help them figure out how to write about race and i've been told you know, right so like things that you know make people uncomfortable or that you know some people are like that well that's not ours we live in a world like we need to figure out how to do it in a way that is sensitive and real and not just like a prop. Classism, sexuality, gender identity, criminal behavior. Um, you know, when people that do engage in criminal activity can also be rich, full, you know, three-dimensional characters. And we do see this, but a lot of times stuff gets pushed and pushed and pushed down when we remove the layers. Um, so this is definitely not a comprehensive list. And if you want to um, drop into the chat other things that you consider to be hard things or things that you're writing about, um, that's fantastic. Um, and I think um, I think that, you know, we can we can expand the list and we can think about what, um, you know, how that gets, what are the things that we avoid? Um, okay, so trauma-informed fiction. So how do we kind of go from this idea that there are these hard things and we want to write about them, but we want to, we, how do we, what, you know, how do we do that in a trauma-informed way? Um, so there's no formal definition of trauma-informed fiction. Um, I create... <laughs> I crafted this definition from a couple of different sources. Um, so, and, and kind of based on the ideals of trauma-informed practice in general. And so I would consider trauma-informed fiction to be writing that leads with empathy that recognizes and appreciates the prevalence of trauma and the implications that trauma might have for potential readers, right? So approximately 64% of adults have experienced trauma in their lives. Um, it's writing that is affirming, sensitive, and to the extent possible, responsive to the needs of those who have experienced trauma, and writing that offers a safe space and the possibility of healing while presenting positive emotional and relational behaviors. So like, the idea for me is that the writing should be real, that people can recognize themselves, but still also feel safe um, and not necessarily re-traumatized. So how do we do that? Um, that's what we're gonna sort of look at. So the strategies to craft writing that is affirmative, sensitive, and responsive. So 
um, first of all, how do we do, how do we write something that is affirming? Um, and I think that writing traumatic experiences um, is affirming when we do it with honesty, clarity, specificity, and fullness. So, um, you know, it's my second point here, but like, you know, maybe raise your hand or put a yes in the chat if you have ever heard, you know, show don't tell, right? I mean, I feel like that is the cornerstone of things that we hear as writers, like show don't tell. And so um, I think that writing is affirming when it shows what characters or situations are experiencing without editorializing or characterizing. Um, so someone can be in a depressive state, they can be anxious, they can be dissociating, they can be really high, they can be whatever. And we can really show that by getting into the details of the experience without necessarily editorializing, without saying this was a deep depression or um, I, you know, she had never felt so sad in her entire life. Like, let's really show what that means. Um, and that's so not pulling back from details and getting those details from the body, I feel like is especially important when it comes to being affirming and and kind of being honest, right? So thinking about how does it feel to have this experience? Like, you know, if you're anxious, what does that feel like? Is your heart racing? Are your hands sweating? Are you jittery? Are there different ways that you're anxious, right? There, I have many levels of anxiety. You know, there's the like, nauseous pit of my stomach, like not can't breathe anxiety when I'm pretty sure that like, you know, the whole world is going to figure out that I'm, you know, a flawed and failing imposter in everything that I do. There's also the anxiety that's like a little bit more jittery, a little bit more like excited, anxious. We can really show that and bring people close. Um, and then they can connect. And we also under understand then that like this experience of anxiety is one version of it, right? Because if we experience those of us who who deal with some issues, we we may deal with some issues and not others, and we we experience them in our own ways. So um, we we can't say like, well, I had a panic attack because my panic attack could be different than your panic attack, right? And from somebody else's panic attack. So we want to like really get into it and bring it to life. And for someone who has never had a panic attack, then suddenly they're having that experience too, but in like a safe way, right? They're not necessarily having that experience, but they're really coming to see what that experience is like. So, you know, and I use panic attack, especially because that is one of those things that for me personally, I didn't understand until I actually had them. And even when I started having panic attacks, I didn't realize that's what they were. I was like, huh? Like that, that's what, is that what this is really? Um, uh, so it, cause it, it felt to me different than how I'd heard it described for other people. One of the other things that I think is really, really important when we're writing to, for writing to be affirming is that we allow for a multiplicity of emotions to exist in the presence or aftermath of trauma or whatever these hard things are. So like, 
for someone, like I said before, that, that idea that, you know, someone can have a, you know, have desire and like a fulfilling sex life when, you know, they've had sexual trauma can be really like this weird tension. Like, you know, we establish a character that had, you know, sexual trauma, then for the rest of our time, any kind of sexual experience is just going to be terrible, or it's going to be really, really freighted. Um, and I think that there is a world where that's yes, and there can still be actual like good things that happen there. Someone can be a you know, have really struggled with a lot of different things, but also be successful in other ways. And they can be really, really sad, like at the lowest point of their life, but also have a sense of humor. Um, so I think that allowing for those things to exist and writing them in that way, like thinking about the fullness of a situation um, really makes a character or a situation more real and it allows people to connect with it better. You know, I, I can see myself when the character is multidimensional. Um, and, and likewise, then, you know, allowing characters to be flawed and imperfect, right? We don't want the you know the the hero in any story or the the protagonist to be completely perfect and i mean i think we know that but sometimes we're afraid to let them you know do something really shitty um i know i was i was like oh i don't i don't want him to do that like i don't want him to do that and then i kind of had to like oh yeah like he would though all right yeah um and we have to allow for that again so it can be affirming of real life and people can kind of recognize and relate a bit more all right so writing to be sensitive um so i think that to be sensitive in writing as in life is to kind of approach things with self-awareness self-care and trust. And these can be a little bit competing, um, which is where, you know, it's, there's a real, there's a whole lot of instinct that goes into it. So on the one hand, it's really, really important for us to be present to our own unconscious biases, um, internalized assumptions and cultural expectations. Like I work with a person who says really, really awful things on a daily basis because she assumes certain things about me that are completely off. And so she offends me on a daily basis because she makes especially classist comments. She makes veiled racist comments. She makes um, ableist comments. And I just sort of like... I mean, she's my boss in a very small, you know, it's, there's only so much you can do sometimes. And I'm kind of like, okay, like you, this is you, this is, you know, so I think that as writers, we have to be not that way, right? We have to understand, I, you know, who am I? What are my experiences? Where do they sit within the rest of the world? And like, how might they be coming through or not coming through in whatever I'm writing? Um, doing that means hopefully that you'll, you'll recognize your blind spots and your limitations and do some research and get feedback to help you round that out to help you at least see where like a pitfall might be or where something might hit someone else in a completely wrong way. Um, I think, and at the same time, come 
coming back to that thing that I said in the beginning about being your own first reader, I think it's really, really important to listen to your own reactions and feelings as you write. Like, does this feel good to me? Like, does this feel too close? Is this painful in an unnecessarily painful way? Or is this painful in a like good cathartic sort of a way? Is this too brutal? Is this, you know, is this brutal for the sake of being brutal? Or is this like, I really need you to understand how bad this experience was for this person in order to show you their growth as a character. Um, a, a quick note on that. I was saying that like, when I started working with writers and editors, I got pushback and there, you know, in my book, there is a scene that I had these two male readers were very much like, I don't know. I don't think that you should, I don't, I don't, I, I think that this might not get through down the line. And I was like, well, why? Um, and, and it was, it's a rape. And they were like, well, but I don't, you know, I'm not sure exactly. And I was like, well, until you, until you can tell me exactly which part of this you think is wrong, I can't really change it. You know, I'm not going to pull back because this experience makes you uncomfortable. Now, if I had gotten to like women readers and it was really making them uncomfortable. They were like, this is re-traumatizing. This is, then that would make me think. When I got to those women readers, they were like, no, that really hurt. But it was really like, I, it was good. Like that, it was what it needed to be. And I think that's the, if your gut tells you you're doing something the right way and someone else is telling you no, it's, there's a, you have to weigh, is it, because of a blind spot or is it because of something on their side, right? And that's where your instincts, you know, you really have to balance all of your instincts here. Once you've done the writing, a way that we can be sensitive and I think really make our work trauma-informed is to provide trigger warnings, or introductions and to even provide hints within like your marketing or your outreach or like however it is that you're spreading the like however this this work is going out into the world sort of allowing a like a little bit of the idea that this is going to be challenging to to be part of the way it goes out right um so I think that it's just that way people aren't completely startled when they get, if they get to a, br a really brutal passage, right? Someone that I, you know, I had a, a someone that I reached out to um, in advance of my book coming out. She's an influencer. And I was like, Hey, would you like to read this? And she was like, I really can't read things that have suicidal ideation in them. It's just too much for me. And I was like, okay, cool. I would rather someone not read than read something and be triggered into a place that they can't handle, that they're not ready for. Um, I had other people say, I'm not ready for this yet. I will get to it when I am ready. And then they, when they were ready, they, they knew what they were getting into. And that's where I think that setting expectations for readers, you know, some folks feel like have, have iffy mixed feelings about trigger warnings. Um, but I think there is, you're not giving anything away to just help someone be emotionally ready to enter a dark space. All right, so. Writing that is responsive. So I think that what we can do, even as we're working to make writing that is real and affirming and really is getting into the details and not hiding or pulling away, I think we can also 
challenge norms, expectations, and traditional conventions. So things like resisting automatic expectations based on unconscious biases or social conventions, things like, you know, toxic masculinity, gender roles, assumptions about access to resources, education, et cetera, like really thinking about, you know, as we're writing something, is this, am I just kind of reinforcing certain things? And if so, I mean, there's a place for that. There's a reason for that sometimes, you know, especially depending on what you're you're talking about. Um, but but even within like our our protagonists are here, like I think resisting pushes for stuff that like are great plot devices or that move stories along or make add surprise into something, but that maybe just reinforce things that we don't want to reinforce. Um, you know, one example really quickly is that I, there, there was a scene in my book where, uh, you know, this a-hole ex comes and approaches the female protagonist and um, her new love interest, who's also the, the book is told in two POVs. Um, but the, so the male protagonist is like, Hey, you need to leave. And he's forceful, but not aggressive or violent. And a couple of my, you know, my editors were like, he really needs to just punch this guy. If this guy came into my house and came up and said that to my, to my girlfriend, I would punch him. And I'm like, okay. And that's what would happen in like the movie version of like in a lot of the versions, but that's not who this character is. And that's not a stereotype that I want to reinforce that like when woman is threatened, man comes in and like gets violent, right? That's not, that may have a purpose in what you're doing, but it's thinking about like, am I doing this because it has a purpose or am I doing it because that's what, people expect to happen right um for me like that just wasn't the character it was, like, it was like he wouldn't do that it was like if you like read this guy he would not do that um and so I just think checking that as you go through avoid tropes that glorify romanticize and normalize unhealthy toxic or abusive behaviors um so this is like the stuff that I was saying when I decided I was writing a love story, I really needed it to not do these things like that aggressive, unwanted pursuit as the basis where like person says not interested. Other person says, sure you are. And doggedly hounds that person until they wear down. Right. Like, you know, I, stalking is not sexy. Right. Like, let's not normalize that. Save your relationships. Like. It was really important to me. My book opens with a person that is about to throw herself off of a bridge and she meets the the male protagonist on the bridge. It was really important to me that that not be a, hey, stop, don't do it kind of moment, right? We've seen that. I did not, it was very important to me that this character save herself. Even though there's a relationship and even though that relationship is part of it, she needed to save herself. Having a, you know someone else swoop in and be like, this is why my life is better feels that's not the world that I want to live in. Um, violence does not equal love. Again, that's the fighting, right? And I'm not talking about consensual BDSM, like do your thing, but, you know, fighting to defend someone's honor. Um, that's like, just not, I don't know. That's just not love. Um, codependency also, you know, again, that's sort of part of the savior relationship thing too. Like, I need you so much. I can't go on without you. Like, yes, 
And when that's a real basis for something, that's just not something that I think we we want to continue to reinforce. Um, Challenging mainstream discomfort, I think, is a way that we resist norms and expectations. Um, so, you know, again, these things that people don't want to talk, just by doing this work, we're challenging some mainstream discomfort. There are things that people don't necessarily want to see. Um, and if if we're showing it to them, we're getting up close, we're talking about it, we're telling that story. Um, we're being responsive to the needs of the of you know the readers the the people who've experienced trauma the people who've been through hard situations um we're not letting that be a thing that they have to just experience alone and sit with quietly um and then this last point i mean it's sort of part of all the rest of it but the way I like to think about all of this is the idea of like writing toward an optimistic reality, um, thinking about, you know, like that, I think it's Abe Lincoln, like the, the better angels of our nature, right? So like, again, when I think about that, that scene that I wrote where the character like doesn't fight the other guy, it's not it, like I had written this character to be a good guy he was like if i could build a realistic version of like a decent white man right it was it was difficult in some ways um but like to to say what's a realistic way that this that we could have a good guy and he's believable but he's also like an optimistic reality. This is like what maybe some people might strive towards, like to not be um, toxically masculine, to not be, you know, to not need to come in and control situations. Um, those, you know, to have a, a female protagonist who is really, forceful and strong, even in her weakest points, right? Who recognizes when she's sort of dependent and doesn't want to, to be that way. People who are, are willing to apologize or acknowledge their, their issues. Um, that those to me, that was, that is one way I think to be responsive um not everything i think needs to be a happy ending or a, a beautiful story in order to do that right but i think that you know we when we think about how people respond do they do the easy thing or the hard thing do they do the you know nobody's always going to do what we wish they would do but sometimes they can um so those are the three points and as I suspected, um, cause this is a lot, um, I'm going to skip the example for now. Um, because I'd like to spend time hearing any questions that anyone has, um, and talking about your thoughts on this, what, um, what else you're interested in, um, what you think. So, um, let's see, where is the does that sound good? Does anybody like, do we have questions, thoughts, things to share? Um, I'm trying to see, let's see if I can see more folks. So it's like you want to do a little thumbs up, little reaction thing, or like if you, if you want to move to discussion, that would be great. If you want to just start popping questions into the chat, that would be good. Um, and I'll, I'll start, um, if, if that's how we're going to go, I'll just stop sharing my screen and we'll just move straight into that. We thinking, yes, no. Okay. All right. I'm used to teaching like, like college freshmen. So I'm used to rooms of people that are like, yeah, I don't really feel like saying anything, but it's helpful. So give me one second to stop the share. All right. There we go. I did it.
I think, right? This The share is gone. Yes, thank you. All right, fantastic. So I've got like all of these windows open. So just pardon me while I try to figure out all of these different things. Um, and let me see if we have questions. Where did the chat go? Oh, that's not helpful. Okay. Okay, there it is. All right. So if anybody has questions, either of you, so I don't see where I can't, there it is. Okay. All right. So if anyone, I don't see any questions in the chat right now. So if you want have a question, you want to drop it in the chat. Awesome. If not, we all seem to be like, you know, functioning people. You can either do the raise your hand thing or, um, oh, okay. Victoria, I see your hand. Yes. Hey. Hi. I guess my question is sort of, I think a lot of times when we write about things like this, of course, we come from some of our own personal experience and putting that into our writing. And I know at least with myself, you adjust things and you add elements that are more fiction or you play up things in certain ways. And I'm guessing, how do you kind of gauge where like your real experience makes, I guess, like any things that you add to it okay? Like how much should we be checking with others about things that we're changing or like getting other people's opinions on something? Because I think sometimes, I know at least for myself, I almost get nervous writing like a full honest experience. So I'll have maybe 70% of it is genuine and 30% of it is sort of made up. And I wonder how, I guess, how much liberty do we have with that 70, 30 before it's, I don't know, like taking the piss out of the experience or you're you know, creating things that maybe people can't relate to in the same way. Right. That's a great question. Um, what I think is really interesting is that, so when I started, when I started writing, um, like I said, I was in this really bad place and I, I basically, um, just for a little second, cause it, and it will relate, I swear. I was not doing well. And I knew though, because I have, I have two kids. Um, I knew that I would not take my own life. I knew that I would not do that, but I was in a really hard space. And I kind of thought if I could, how would I do that? And I had, I immediately saw this person walking onto a bridge with weights on. And I was like, that's how you would do it. And then I started to construct her life and her life couldn't be like mine because if I couldn't do it, she, so, I took away the kids. I took away like, and I started to, because I always did, I never wrote fiction because I was always writing like memoir adjacent. It was just like, I would change names. And I really started to like, okay, what if this thing was the direct opposite of my experience? So where I went left, this person went right. And I think that as you move into that, like, 70 30 or 60 40 or 50 50 whatever however you do it i think what starts to happen is that the character becomes more the character and less you you're still writing it you're still informing it and you still know so like when when my character had panic attacks i still had to write it and i had to really pay attention to like what my anxiety felt like and it was really, really funny because um, I would be having, like, I would be really, really anxious. And there's this part of me that's like, oh, my God, everything is awful. Like, I hate, every, like, I can't even believe it. And then this other little tiny voice was like, okay, pay attention. All right, your hands are doing this. You feel like literally started cataloging the details so that I could put them down later. Um I did have the benefit though of also like checking some things with other people. Like, so my character, 
had a very different life in some ways. And I had, I kind of, I made certain assumptions based on like, if I had gone through that, this is how I think I would have reacted. And this is why. And I talked to people who had had that experience. And a lot of that was right. So I think you can, if you do it in that way, right? Like if you take your 70, 30, but you put yourself into how would I have done this? I think that's how you stay in that genuine place. I think that's how you know that you're still kind of, because you're putting your human thought into it and it becomes that balance of you and the other character, like, or the character. But um, yeah, does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, anyone else? No other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to share my screen again for just one second. And why is this? Sorry. I don't know. You probably can hear my all my dings coming through. Um, just because where did it go? Okay. Um, I'm just going to share this because if you are... Um, Inter interested in exploring this more deeply and actually like doing exercises, um, getting feedback, really kind of digging into each of those elements. I'm doing like a six week workshop that's starting next week and, and really like the Zoom sessions will start, I think maybe the week after, maybe next week. No, they'll start the week after. Um, and it's, it's virtual. It's through this Transformative Language Arts Network, um, which is a great organization um, of writers who are um, committed to using writing to kind of for healing purposes. Um, or you could reach out to me um, for like individual consultation, coaching, editing, whatever. Like if you have stuff that you're kind of thinking, you know, you have questions about it, your ideas that you're interested in developing, like I'm, I'm always down for that stuff. That's kind of, that's my jam. Um, so there's that. Um, and then I just, you know, there's all my little bits, little, just Google me. It's fine. We don't need to stay there. Um, and then I just wanted to say thank you to you guys. And, um, I know that Julian's got stuff to add, but like, just, oh, thank you to, to Blue Stoop and, um, don't forget to support them if you can, because I know that Blue Stoop is in a really um, challenging, but also uh, important moment that I think is going to kind of open things up for them. And um, things like this, if you if you enjoy going to like free workshops um, and having that available, um, I think supporting Blue Stoop is really important. Um, so thank you all. Um, and back to you, Julian. And I'll wait, I'll stop the share. Let me stop the share because it's important. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that, Autumn, and the fantastic workshop and the uh, kind plug for, for our work. Um, I guess uh, it's making you guys answer that question again. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I'm about to put some links in the chat. Um, donations, as you have heard, are greatly appreciated. Also next week, um, Taylor Towns, my co-director and I, we're going to do a meet and greet instead of our kind of typical Thursdays on the stoop thing. It's on Zoom. Uh, if you want to come chat with us, get to know us a little bit, um, we can brainstorm together about, you know, what's up next for the organization. Um, there's also in the links I just sent a feedback survey about this particular session. You can tell Autumn what a fantastic job she did. You can subscribe to our weekly newsletter to get links to other things that we do. And I uh, also want to mention that this summer we're doing uh, a big slate of single session classes. They're really affordable. Um, we're going to have a variety of options to make them accessible to people. Um, and you can keep an eye out for that in our newsletter. We're going to calling it summer school, which hopefully be more fun than actual summer school. Um, I think it will be. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to Autumn for the great session and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Hey. Thanks, Autumn.